Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today for um, this parathyroid disease uh, Q&A session. Uh, for those of you who have uh, joined me before, uh, welcome back. And uh, for those of you joining for the first time, welcome. Um, and for those who haven't been here before, just a quick uh, review of, uh, I guess, my educational history. Um, I was, uh, or got my um, uh, biology pre-med uh, degree in a small school in uh, Massachusetts called Holy Cross, a Jesuit uh, college. Um, got my medical degree at Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C., and then uh, did my general surgery training for seven years uh, in Boston in the Harvard University uh, surgical training system. I then did additional fellowship training uh, in endocrine surgery at uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and I stayed there for about 10 years as uh, staff as an academic surgeon before coming to Tampa and joining uh, the Norman Parathyroid Center. Uh, where I serve now as the, the medical director. Uh, behind me you'll see a, a picture of the hospital for endocrine surgery where we operate. Um, it's a one-of-a-kind uh, hospital uh, dedicated entirely to the care of the endocrine surgical patient. A truly great place to, to work and to uh, be cared for. So with that, let me get started. We're going to uh, go through our questions and thank you to all of you who uh, sent some questions in. Hopefully they'll be helpful for everybody and everybody can learn something today. We're going to first do um, uh, questions grouped by the platform or the, the social media platform that they came in from. So we're starting with Facebook, okay? And so let's get started. Question number one, is there any way to manage your calcium levels prior to surgery if you have hyperparathyroidism? Uh, really good question. There's not much you can do, although um, if you keep yourself really well hydrated, then that can sometimes keep your calcium levels a bit lower or certainly prevent them from getting any higher. And uh, really the reason for that is, is that all electrolytes like calcium are just uh, concentrations. And if you increase your blood volume by staying really well hydrated, uh, then that can lower those numbers a little bit. And I've even had patients over the years say that doing that actually helps them feel a little bit better in terms of uh, making their parathyroid related symptoms a bit more manageable. Um, certainly, you want to avoid taking calcium supplements. Uh, in extreme cases, avoiding calcium-containing foods can also sometimes help keep those numbers down, although that's usually not necessary. So hydration, avoid calcium supplements, those are the best things that you can do. Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, next question is, would you recommend genetic testing if someone developed parathyroid disease at or before the age of 30? Uh, another really good question. Uh, Typically not, you know, um, uh, a trigger for, for thinking of genetic testing uh, really doesn't come from having this diagnosis at age 30 or younger. Uh, it's obviously a lot less common to get parathyroid disease when you're in your 20s or teens, but we certainly see it. Um, really the impetus uh, for thinking about genetic testing for hereditary forms of parathyroid disease like multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes 1 and 2 or familial non-MEN hyperparathyroidism, uh, really we start to think about that when you have three first degree family members who have hyperparathyroidism or have, have that diagnosis. So first degree family members mean parent and sibling, or I'm sorry, parent and child relationships or siblings, okay? Good question. Um, question number three, what does normal calcium fluctuation look like? I tend to dip between high and normal levels of calcium, and I don't know if that's considered normal. Um, that is not considered normal. If your calcium is elevated, that's not really ever normal, certainly, um, or, or, or uh, especially if it continues to go above uh, the normal range. And so normal, you know, patients without hyperparathyroidism, you know, your calcium can change a little bit, but it should always stay within, you know, the nine milligram per deciliter range. It's not that uncommon for people with hyperparathyroidism to have fluctuating calcium levels like you're describing, where it'll be high when you check it one day, and then a, a couple months later when it's rechecked, it'll be down in the normal range in the nines, and then the next time it's checked, it's high again. We see this pattern not that uncommonly. And it's a common mistake or, or reason for delay in treatment because doctors will do this with their patients and they'll see a high calcium and actually notice it, repeat those labs and find that it's down a little bit or even in the normal range the next time and then forget about it thinking there's no problem. 
It's important in those cases to continue to check those calcium levels at least a number of more times to see what the overall pattern is. And if it's fluctuating up and down where you're seeing a number of um, data points where your calcium is elevated, it's, it's most likely that you have hyperparathyroidism and a full workup for that should be done, okay? Good question. Uh, next question for us, are hyperparathyroidism symptoms constant or, or intermittent? Do certain things make symptoms worse? For example, eating or exercising or hormonal changes? Good question. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the symptoms, what, what are common symptoms associated with parathyroid disease? Chronic fatigue is a common one. Bone and joint pain is common. Various types of mood problems like anxiety or irritability or malaise can be pretty common. Uh, neurocognitive symptoms like uh, difficulty with concentration or, or short-term memory loss are pretty common. Muscle weakness, et cetera. Uh, these are some of the symptoms that we're talking about. Um, I don't know of too many things that can, can make them worse, although them fluctuating is pretty common. They, you know, a lot of patients will say that sometimes they feel okay and, and other, other days they feel terrible. And so fluctuating of symptoms is not that unusual. The only thing that I've seen that can make symptoms a lot worse are if people take high doses of vitamin D, and there's another question later on that will pertain to this. Um, doctors often put their patients on vitamin D when they have high calcium and, and, and what is usually associated with it is a low vitamin D level. And when they take those high doses of, of vitamin D, patients complain pretty commonly that their symptoms worsen quite a bit. Not everybody, but it can make them worse. That's really the only thing I've seen that can make them worse. Uh, next question. <laughs> this is a great one. Can you discuss other possible treatment options for parathyroid disease? I want to avoid surgery. Most people do want to avoid surgery, so that's, uh, that's understandable. Uh, unfortunately, there is no other therapy for hyperparathyroidism. There's no medical treatment that currently exists that treats this disease in any effective way. Uh, so the only way to treat it, uh, unfortunately, is, um, is with surgery. And as you probably know, or many people that have joined know, the majority of, of cases, uh, what causes this disease is a benign tumor developing in one of your parathyroid glands. And really the only way to treat it is to remove that affected parathyroid gland, okay? Sorry to disappoint you out there, whoever you were with this question, but uh, if you wanna treat this, then you have to have surgery, at least for now. Here's another question, a really good one. What symptoms or damage to your body can be reversed or corrected after surgery and what cannot? Um, this is a, a pretty um, important question and um, frustrates those of us who take care of this disease because we commonly see patients have this disease for a number of years before it gets treated. And uh, why is this a problem or why is it frustrating? Because most of the damage that this disease does to the body is not reversible. Um, so what are the things that uh, quickly that, that hyperparathyroidism does to damage your body? It can damage your kidneys, so your, your risk for renal failure goes up. It can accelerate atherosclerotic change in both the vessels to your heart and to your brain. So coronary vascular and cerebrovascular disease, uh, your risk for that goes up, so stroke risk and heart attack risk. It, uh, it also causes accelerated bone loss through the action of parathyroid hormone. And the only thing that I've seen data on um, where there's improvement after surgery is in bone density. Uh, many patients with bone loss do show improvement in their T-scores after successful surgery, but kidney damage, damage to the heart, damage to the brain, those things do not improve, which is why we advocate very strongly for treating this disease as soon as it's diagnosed. Okay, great question. All right, next one. Uh, I guess that's, uh, I sort of answered that here. What do you think the average amount of time someone has had a parathyroid tumor growing before getting it removed? Uh, unfortunately, we, um, we often see that patients have had the disease or, or had clear bioche uh, biochemical evidence of this disease for a number of years, sometimes um, between 10 and 20 years before getting treated. Uh, there's a number of reasons that we see that, but uh, overall, most patients have had the disease for uh, certainly between five and ten years before they come to treatment. Um, part of that is that um, a lot of patients don't get frequent, you know, they're not getting frequent lab draws, and so it takes some time for the biochemistry to be noticed. 
Um, but then after that, a lot of doctors, as I alluded to in the previous question, um, will tell patients it's not that high, you know, we don't have to worry about it, let's watch it. And so treatment's delayed really for no good reason and to the patient's detriment, in my opinion. So um, um, between five and 10 years is really common in terms of an average amount of time between um, disease being evident and the patient coming to treatment. Okay, great, this is another good question. My calcium is uh, consistently high, but my parathyroid hormone level is normal. Could I still have parathyroid disease with these results? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. This is another common mistake that we see doctors make where calcium is noted to be elevated and they check parathyroid hormone levels but find that they're you know, within the normal range. Um, that does not mean you don't have hyperparathyroidism. PTH does not need to be elevated to make this diagnosis or to have this disease. Uh, about 20% of patients with this disease do you know, actually have parathyroid hormone levels that never measure above the normal range. The concept here is, the, is what we call inappropriately normal PTH values. And what do I mean by that? The only reason your body secretes PTH or parathyroid hormone is when your calcium is low, right? So if your calcium is elevated, your body really has no reason to make this hormone. It should be quite low. And so if you have a calcium of 11, which is clearly high, and your PTH is 40, which is well within the normal range, that is inappropriately normal for that calcium level. And so that is um, diagnostic or indicative of having hyperparathyroidism, even though that PTH level is in the normal range, okay? That's something that's commonly missed by doctors that are not that familiar with the disease. And so um, pay attention to that when you look at your lab results. If your PTH is in the mid to, to high normal range, even as low as 20, which is towards the lower end of the normal range, and your calcium is elevated, most likely you have hyperparathyroidism, okay? Thank you for that question. It was a really good one. Okay, that's the questions um, from Facebook. We're going to switch to questions from our YouTube followers now. Uh, first one is, my doctor said that low vitamin D... <laughs> this is a great question, sorry. This drives me crazy. My doctor said that low vitamin D is making my calcium high, and he put me on vitamin D supplements, which brought my calcium from 10.8 to 10.3. If you were me, would you seek a second opinion? Uh, yes, I would run as fast as you can to get a second opinion. Here's why I say that. Um, it's really common and uh, really most patients with hyperparathyroidism have low vitamin D. The reason for that is that one of the actions of parathyroid hormone is to convert your vitamin D to a different, more active form. This helps you absorb calcium from your, from your gut, from GI sources. And so you're constantly depleting your vitamin D and that's why it's low. And so doctors will look at your labs and your calcium will be elevated and they almost always see a low vitamin D. And doctors like this one say that we need to replete your vitamin D to make sure that's not, that isn't what's causing your high calcium. And this is a common mistake. While vitamin D can, or vitamin D deficiency can make your parathyroid hormone levels go up, it never, ever, 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 ever <laughs> causes hypercalcemia. Can't do it. So if your doctor tells you to replete your vitamin D because your calcium is high, that they don't know, they don't understand the physiology, okay? And the fact that it brought your calcium down from 10.8 from to 10.3 while you're on vitamin D supplements, that's just that's just um, it's just luck, you know. It's just, just if you check your calcium, you know, four or five times in a month, it'll be different numbers and it'll go up and down. So that 10 going from 10.8 to 10.3 has nothing to do with you being on vitamin D supplements. Uh, I would stop those vitamin D supplements and seek uh, a second opinion um, about uh, your hyperparathyroidism, okay? It's a really good question. Uh, this is a question relating to thyroid surgery. My parathyroid glands were damaged during my thyroidectomy surgery elsewhere, and my calcium levels are still out of whack a year later. Any advice on what I should do? Um, uh, what they're referring to is, you know, there's a risk when you do a thyroidectomy because the parathyroids are really close to the thyroid that you could sometimes devascularize, remove by accident, or injure those glands. And there's a risk of having little or no parathyroid function after a thyroidectomy. Now, if you haven't experienced a thyroid surgeon, the risk of that is very low, but it's possible. 
And if by, by saying my calcium levels are out of whack a year later, I'm assuming it's that they're that they're low. Um, if you, calcium levels are one thing, but it's important to know what your PTH values are. If your parathyroid hormone levels are measurable, meaning they're in the normal range, but your calcium is low, you'll probably be fine. If your parathyroid hormone levels are really low or, or undetectable a year out from thyroidectomy, then that's um, concerning that you might have a, a, a long-term problem of, with hypoparathyroidism. And if that's the case, there's not any great treatments for that, unfortunately. Um, other than taking uh, calcium and vitamin D, vitamin D supplements. So I would check your parathyroid hormone levels and to, to really get a sense for what's going on. Um, here's a question about uh, reoperative surgery. I've been watching your reoperative uh, videos and had a question. Did these patients not have proper scans the first time? If they did have a 40 CT or Sestamibi scan, shouldn't they have shown the problem gland? Um, good question. Uh, in a lot of these cases, um, for those of you who haven't seen any of my reoperative videos, um, the, the preoperative imaging test that these patients had actually did show their abnormal gland. They just were misinterpreted by the surgeon and ended up having the wrong operation. But in general, it's an you know, uh, important um, concept to talk about is that imaging tests for for seeing abnormal parathyroid glands. The technology, even in 2024, just is not very good. The sensitivity is poor. It's about 50% or so, meaning half of the patients who have hyperparathyroidism in the imaging tests don't show anything. A portion of the other half of these patients uh, who have imaging tests that show something, what is shown on the imaging test is not related to parathyroid tumors or an abnormal parathyroid gland, meaning there are false positive results to these tests. Um, the lack of sensitivity and specificity of imaging tests is why our practice doesn't use the results of those tests to tell us what operation to do. Okay, we think that's really important because if you use imaging results to guide your surgery or to tell you what kind of operation to do, often you're going to do the wrong operation. And that's what a lot of these reoperative vi videos um, show. Okay. Um, this is uh, similar to a couple questions ago. Can you talk a little bit about thyroidectomy and how this might affect the parathyroid glands? What if you need a thyroidectomy, but your parathyroid glands are inside the thyroid gland? So um, similar to what we started to talk about a couple questions ago, when you take the thyroid out, um, you have to be careful with the parathyroid glands, obviously. They're pretty close to the thyroid. And really when you do a thyroidectomy, there's a couple of important things. You essentially are dividing the vessels that supply the thyroid, uh, as well as a ligament that holds your thyroid to the trachea. You're doing that while preserving the nerves to the vocal cords and preserving the parathyroid glands. That's the operation that you're doing when you're a thyroid surgeon. And so if you're an experienced thyroid surgeon, you're very careful to preserve parathyroid glands. And, and even if you're really good, it can't always be done. Depending on the anatomy and the way the vascular supplies are, sometimes you can't save a parathyroid gland. And if that's the case, usually that gland will be auto-transplanted into muscle right away to preserve its function. Um, you talk about parathyroids being inside the thyroid gland, and that's possible. There are, there are times when parathyroid glands can be within the thyroid itself, and there's not much you can do about that. Even if you're the best thyroid surgeon in the world, that's a difficult parathyroid gland to preserve. Um, it's really rare for all four of your parathyroid glands to be within the thyroid, so that shouldn't really be a problem where you're going to lose all your parathyroid glands. Okay, it's a good question, but essentially it comes down to experience, having an experienced thyroid surgeon, obviously. And if you do, then the risk of you having a permanent hypoparathyroidism problem is incredibly low. Okay. Um, this is a question about hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy. Um, what happens to calcium levels in some with parathyroid disease during pregnancy or breastfeeding? Should surgery be avoided until after the baby is born? Um, I'm not sure there's you know, uh, anything specific to say about um, calcium levels with parathyroid disease specific to pregnancy. Their biochemistry presents in, in, in a similar way to those who aren't pregnant. In terms of should, sur you know, should surgery be avoided until after the baby is born? In general, the answer is no. Um, depending on when it's diagnosed in terms of the gestational age of the baby, we recommend that you have uh, the parathyroid disease treated surgically 
in the second trimester, that's the safest time to operate uh, in general during pregnancy. Waiting until after the baby is born is, is um, not recommended because the hypercalcemia of hyperparathyroidism can put the baby at risk for things like preterm labor and uh, you know, uh, premature uh, delivery, et cetera, with the complications that come with that. So it's a good question. In general, when a, a patient is diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism while pregnant, if, if, if we can, um, we recommend uh, parathyroidectomy during the second trimester. Okay, now we're gonna move on to questions that we got from our TikTok uh, followers. Question number one, I have normal calcium but high PTH and lots of symptoms. Is there no way a patient has parathyroid disease if calcium is in the normal range? Um, the answer is, uh, yeah, there is a way. There's, there's a well-described uh, form of hyperparathyroidism called normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism. I will say that it's less common and it's more difficult to diagnose. The reason for that is the biochemistry of this, which is normal calcium, high PTH, and often low vitamin D, looks similar to a number of other um, conditions called uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Secondary hyperparathyroidism means you do not have diseased parathyroid glands, your PTH levels are elevated due to an outside influence. Um, like, what are the common reasons for this? Advanced renal failure will cause this, severe vitamin D deficiency can cause this, uh, something called a renal calcium leak syndrome can cause this, and certain malabsorption problems can cause this, like people who have had a ruin white gastric bypass operation. So it's important to rule out those secondary causes of PTH elevation before making the diagnosis of primary or normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism. But once those have been ruled out effectively, um, then yeah, normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism can cause the same symptoms and the same problems and should, should be treated surgically. Good question. Uh, on a recent trip to the emergency room, my son's calcium was 10.5. Should I be worried about this? He's 18 years old. Um, it's a good question, and um, it allows us to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of age-dependent um, uh, calcium levels, because when you're younger, in your teens, uh, and you're building a skeleton, it's normal to have a higher calcium level. So having a calcium of 10.5 and an 18-year-old would not get me excited. It's probably normal for him, okay? Um, as you get older and those processes settle down, you've, you've reached your, you know, your, your height, et cetera, you're not building new bone as readily, uh, calcium 10.5 would be considered to be elevated, but at age 18 is probably normal, okay? Okay, uh, next question. I have elevated calcium and elevated PTH, so pretty clearly has hyperparathyroidism, and I've had five fractures in the last few years. My doctor says my levels aren't that elevated. Would you just suggest I make a trip to Tampa for a second opinion? Uh, I mean, I'll give you these, you don't have to travel to Tampa, I'll give you the second opinion actually right now. And you might want to get another, like a different doctor because um, you, 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 it sounds like you clearly have hyperparathyroidism and you're having you know, pathologic fractures, fractures. Even in the most conservative person, that is a clear indication to have this treated surgically. So this concept that my levels aren't that elevated makes no sense. It's like having cancer. Nobody says, well, you only have a little bit of cancer. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. We'll just watch it. You either have cancer or you don't. And if you do, you get it treated. Um, if your calcium's elevated, it's either high or it isn't. You either have hyperparathyroidism or you don't have it. And if you have it, it should be treated. Certainly it should be treated if you're having pathologic fractures like you're talking about. So I would definitely get another opinion. You should seek treatment, okay? Uh, that was a good question. Are there any natural remedies for parathyroid disease? Um, this is kind of like that other question about uh, any non-surgical treatments for this. And the answer is, unfortunately, no, none, none that I'm aware of. Uh, there's no natural remedies or medical therapies to treat hyperparathyroidism. You, the only way to treat it is with surgery. Okay, last couple of questions. If I have high calcium but low PTH and low phosphorus, could this be parathyroid disease? Um, I think this is similar to one of the questions we had a bit before where the patient or the, the, the person uh, stated their calcium was high but their PTH was normal. 
I guess it, it, it's going to matter what low PTH means. If it just means it's in the normal range, then yeah, there's a really good chance you have hyperparathyroidism. If it's really low, like in the single digits, like a suppressed PTH, then your high calcium probably is from something else. That's, that's the key. How low is the PTH? If it's 30 or above, you probably have hyperparathyroidism. If it's in the teens or below, um, your high calcium is almost certainly from something else. Okay. Um, okay, this is the last of the pre-submitted uh, questions. I read that parathyroid cancer is rare, but I'm wondering just how rare it is with how many cases you've done, how many times have you seen it? Um, good question. Parathyroid carcinoma is exquisitely rare. Um, you know, most people who take care of this disease, even who do a lot of it, just, you know, either see it once or never see it. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've been in this practice for 10 and I've probably done around 10,000 parathyroid operations and I've probably seen this or taken care of this about 25 times, which is, you know, probably one of the biggest series um, out there and I should, I should look into it and, and get it published. But um, that's a lot of parathyroid carcinoma patients to, for one practitioner to have taken care of. So um, most practice, like most people, like I said, even busy surgeons who do a fair amount of parathyroid surgery just don't see it very often, okay? And then this is going to be the last question. Okay, what would you tell patients who are scared to have surgery for fear of getting hypoparathyroidism? Any advice? Um, it's a good question. Um, depending on the, the type of surgeon, meaning how experienced they are, et cetera, with parathyroid surgery, that, that is a risk of having a parathyroid operation. Um, in this practice, it's you know for straightforward cases, meaning not complicated reoperative parathyroid surgeries, the risk of having hypoparathyroidism after surgery is essentially zero. So I think it really matters about the experience of your surgeon, um, their ability to navigate um, the anatomy of the neck uh, with confidence, understanding the anatomy. And if you do, then it's really, you know, you're not going to damage by mistake parathyroid glands to the point of having hypoparathyroidism. So um, if you come to an experience center or if you're, if you're worried about it, um, then I would recommend um, uh, coming to a, you know, a, a center of excellence or a center where they do a lot of parathyroid surgery like, like we do here. And in that case, the risk for, for this complication should be essentially zero. Okay? And I think that's all the time we have. Um, again, thank you so much to everybody who submitted questions. Um, I hope that those who joined uh, learned something and that people were helped uh, by this session. And uh, Join us for the next one. We'll do another one in another month or so and uh, look to the social media posts uh, uh, for the announcements for it. Okay, otherwise, have a great rest of your afternoon. Until next time.